good to be in the house of the Lord. Amen. Amen. All right. Uh, those, uh, there's about, uh, watching online, there's about, I don't know, 20 of us that have braved the treacherous, <laughs> absolutely impassable conditions to be here tonight. <laughs> uh, but it's good to have you guys online. It's good to have people here. My goodness, the past two Sundays, uh, we've been alone, so this is like a, a full house tonight. Amen. Amen. 
Every time we come into God's house, we also recognize that we have fallen short of the glory of God in thought, word, and deed. Now is the time we go before and confess our sins. So let's take a quiet, reflective moment. Let's bow our heads, confess our sins to God, and beseech him in the name of Jesus Christ to forgive us. Father, we have sinned against you in thought, in word, and in deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We justly deserve your present and eternal punishment, but we are heartily sorry for it, and we sincerely repent of it. And we pray that of your boundless mercy you would forgive us for the sake and in the name of Christ Jesus our Lord. It's in his name we pray this. Amen. Upon a true confession of our heart to God, I announce the grace of God to all of you. I tell you, he forgives you all of your sins. He calls you sons and daughters. He declares you righteous in his powerful name. That is the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Whenever we gather together as God's people, it's also important that we confess who God is. We do that in our congregation through the recitation of the Apostles' Creed. So now let us recite the one and true faith as it is recorded in that creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven, and he sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Good evening, church. Good evening. So, um, so we have three dogs. We have two little, two little puppies, with cute little labs, and another, uh, I don't know what it is, the pit, it's kind of a pit bull kind of thing, but that's the, uh, that's the old dog. And uh, so, all three of those dogs like to eat chicken poop. I don't know what it is about it, but they, every time they get near it, they go after it, and uh, you have to kind of drag them off. So, you know, if, uh, at least once a day when you're out walking them, they'll jet over to that where the, you know, the chicken poop is. <laughs> and, uh, of course, that's also where the electrical fence is for the chicken pen. And I know I told you that the, the fence was broken a few weeks back, but I have since fixed that, that electrical fence. And, uh, so the one dog, uh, he was doing his little thing, his nose to the ground, and then saw the chicken pen and the abundance of chicken poop in there. Rather than, you know, the, 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 the woods and the forest and all the other fun stuff to play with, he goes right over to that fence, puts his nose on it, and gives out a yelp. I mean, a yelp and a jump, and, and then ran, ran back to the house. And um, so... I think that there's a good correlation, uh, corollary maybe, between us and what those dogs did, you know. We have such great things and blessings and hope in Jesus Christ, you know. But I think, I feel like me, we spend a little more time eating chicken poop than we do praising God, you know. But it's, it's just that while we come here. We, we get down and we get our nose to that ground and we get involved in things we shouldn't get done. We have thoughts we shouldn't have. And instead of praising God, you know, and enjoying the riches that he has for you, you know, that's where we are. But here tonight and now, as we gather together and we remember, we're honest about this. We remember that Jesus forgives us. He, he knows us and he loves us anyway. Amen? Amen. So let's, tonight, let's, uh, let's give him thanks. And praise his name 
and uh, just enjoy his presence.
the sick are healed and the dead are raised at the sound of your great name. Jesus, worthy is the Lamb that was slain for us. The Son of God and then you are I am lifted up and all the world will praise your great name your great name Redeemer my healer I am. All right. Uh, <clears throat> we'll do that again because that wasn't recorded. So uh, do you guys go to church? Yeah. What is the name of your church? Yeah. Amen. And we have a special, I was about to say guest, but he's not a guest, a special return home today. Uh, Scott Farber got himself a job in the area and is back. Amen. <laughs> So let me just ask him, Scott, what is the name of your church? Amen. <laughs> Amen. If uh, somebody asks you what your church is all about, what are we going to say? Because if we are not about that. Amen. A few announcements. Ash Wednesday is next Wednesday, 630, traditional service. Uh, Book of, of Apocrypha. We've been doing that. Uh, there's a small gaggle of us that do that study, about 10, 11, 12 of us. It's Zoom. Pam sends it out. You should join the Apocrypha if you don't know what it is. So I don't call it a Bible study because we are not studying the Bible. The Apocrypha is those intertestamental books that are not included within the canon of Scripture. Uh, yet... Do we not do studies all the time using books? And these are uh, phenomenal to know. They are contained in the Roman Catholic canon. And Martin Luther, even in his Bible, did have the Apocrypha. So a lot of people are unfamiliar with it. And it's a wonderful study. It's this Saturday at 12 noon. Friday night, ladies' Bible study on Zoom this Friday, 7 o'clock. Uh, the El Coos LWML prayer breakfast, Saturday. Well, we can do that. It's not until next Saturday. Do not use last year's offering envelopes. Please only use this year's, 2021, 
for tithes and donations. The number on some envelopes have changed, and in order to make sure your tithes and donations are credited properly, we need you to destroy. I like how it says destroy. Destroy those old envelopes. If you have those out, just scowl at those old envelopes. Destroy the old envelopes and use only the 2021 envelopes. Sign up for the Easter lilies or in the back. Uh, if you're if you're interested in an intramural co-ed uh, sport group, we're going to start one here in the spring. Levi Tack is doing that. You can sign up in the back. And the Marathon Prayer Relay, April 3rd, 6 a.m. to 6 p.m., 30-minute increments. Sign up. I can't believe that all the slots aren't there. There's only 24 slots. 24 people to sign up for 30 minutes of prayer on that silent Saturday in Easter. All right. On the count of three, we're going to say, wake up, George. One, two. Three. Well, howdy there, George. How are you? Hey, I'm fine, Pastor. <laughs> huh? Um, you don't you don't seem down, but but George, you don't seem right either. Is is something a little off, George? Hey, uh, whatever do you mean, Pastor? <laughs> You seem a little, I don't know, maybe a little nervous. Uh, what's going on there, George? Um, so, Pastor, um, mm, do you want to talk about somebody else tonight? <laughs> you know, and make a little fun of them. <laughs> How about Andre in the back there? <laughs> we never talk about the Russian man. <laughs> Wait, why would we talk about Andre? Well, I mean, we usually make jokes about people like poor Scott Wells or Graham in his abs. <laughs> How about we say some stuff about Andre tonight? What do you think? <laughs> you're, you're strangely coming out of the gate. Wait, wait a minute, George. Are you trying to distract me from maybe what's really going on with you? Never, <laughs> Pastor. It's just Andre is Russian. Is there an election coming up? <laughs> he could tamper with it. Hey, let's talk about that. Yeah, that's it. <laughs> George, you are trying to distract me, aren't you, George? What? Why would I ever do such a thing, Pastor? I think you are. Come on, George, what's going on? Well, uh, 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 okay. Uh, here goes. I've decided something. Pastor! <laughs> oh. I just said it heard, just read it said confidently. <laughs> yes, so, so what have you decided, George? I've decided hmm, that cheating a little on test isn't bad. Wait. Wait, what? Yes, I've been in virtual monster school all year, and it's hard. And I'm tired of it. And, well, it's easier to cheat on virtual school. And so, yes, since it's been rough, I get to cheat there. I said it. <laughs> so let me get this straight. If things are hard, you get to cheat. Yes, it's my new rule. It's monsters' morality. <laughs> so, wait, monsters get to have different morality than human beings? Yes, we're not human, duh. <laughs> so, well, says who? Says me. <laughs> oh, dear George. Don't try and change my mind, pastor. You're a human... <laughs> and humans don't get to tell monsters with this luscious green fur what to do. You don't get a say about our morality. <laughs> well, what about God? Does God get a say? Um, God? Yeah, God. I mean, he's the one who made morality, so does he get a say? Oh, why do you always have to bring him up, Pastor? <laughs> God, Jesus, God, Jesus. <laughs> well, it is church and all. <sighs> okay. 
George, you know that you don't get to change morality. I, I know things are hard, but you know that cheating is bad, don't you? No matter what you say. Oh, yes, Pastor. So, George, the best thing to do is just admit your sin. Go tell your teacher what you've done and ask God to forgive you, and God will. But, George, we don't get to make morality up. I know, Pastor. Can I just virtually tell her I did it? <laughs> I will do that. <laughs> George, listen, I don't know what's going to happen at school, but God does love you very much, and God will forgive you. Plus, I think perhaps even they'll understand. But no matter what, we'll have peace on the inside because we confessed our sin. You know, I hate to say this, but you're right, Pastor. <laughs> <sighs> Be quiet, little longer. <laughs> I actually do feel a little better. I, I knew the right thing, even when I said I didn't. <laughs> Amen, George. Let's pray. Say, dear God, dear God, thank you. Thank you. For being our forgiving God. Being our forgiving God. Amen. Amen. All right. <laughs> My goodness. All right, let's pray. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Pray as always that this message is a message you've got to have for your people. May the proud amongst us be humbled and the humble lifted up. Father, I also pray that this message excites us to trust in you. In the name of Jesus, amen. All right, this is the last sermon in the sermon series on worldview. Amen. Amen. So if you've been with us, you know, um, Bill, some people said that, uh, can you turn those, do you, do you know how to do that? Turn these lights on for me right here. Do you know how to do that? You don't know how to do that? Uh, that little thing, well, it's just that I know that I'm dim. Yes. Amen. In more ways than one. I was talking about the lighting, but in more ways than one. Uh, but that's all right. That's all right. That's all right. Don't, don't mess with things. And then I was just wondering if you knew how to do it. Uh, all right. So we are right in the midst of a sermon series on worldview. This is the last one in it. When I say worldview, what do I mean? A worldview is a concept of how you interpret and understand this world around us. Every experience we have is interpreted through our worldview. Basically, you take in information, you process it very quickly, and you quickly interpret how I'm to take the experiences in my life. You may not recognize it, but your belief system and worldview, how you view things, actually has a tremendous impact on how you behave, what you think, how you feel. It's a worldview, how I view the world all around me. See, I said, let's not mess with this, and here we go. Now we're messing with it. <laughs> now you've got them pulsating at me. Now they're just pulsating, pulsating. Now they're going down. Now that one, that, that is going to be supremely annoying if all that does is pulsate at me all night. There we go. All right. <laughs> wow. There we go. Wow. All right. You can see me now. All right. Oh, my goodness. All right. You know, it's funny. No, no, it is, it is recording. It's just, I'm going to do an aside here. It's funny. And I, I love Bill and I love Jim. Uh, and I love, I love everybody. I ask, this is, this is the art of communication. Do you know how to do A? Their response is what? Yes. No. I don't know how to do A. All right. Just forget about it. Don't mess with it. And then immediately, what happens? They mess with it. <laughs> this is the art of communication. It's fantastic. It's, fantastic. Uh, it's men. It's not men. If we, know, we know how to do it now. Amen. All right. Now, I'm going to start at the beginning. Let's pretend that those last three minutes did not take place. All right. 
So this is the last sermon in this series on worldview. A worldview is how you interpret information, how you interpret information, and how you process it, and it affects how you behave. All right. So, for example, have you ever noticed that two different human beings, two different people, can experience the exact same thing? They can experience the exact same thing and behave and think wildly differently about those experiences. The reason for that is because of the worldview in which they're processing that information. The genesis of this sermon series, uh, my family and I went to Kentucky. We went to the Ark Encounter. We went to the Creation Museum. And uh, it, it has a tremendous impact. It's brilliant. If you ever get an opportunity to go, you should absolutely go. You should absolutely go and see this. It's very professionally done, very biblical, and it is God-pleasing. Uh, and so I just encourage anyone to take that trip. Now, a biblical worldview begins on the left-hand side. We've done this before, but I need to get everybody on the same page. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The first sentence in the Bible. A biblical worldview assumes God and assumes that God is outside of nature, outside of what we might call the whole show of nature. God stands outside of that, all right? And God created time, and God created everything. So everything that exists, the diversity of life on earth, all that is, with the exception of God, God created. God made. The biblical worldview assumes that reality. Then, you are the apple of his eye. Let us make man in our image, after our likeness. So God created man in his own image. In the image of God, he created him. Male and female, he created them. You are not simply a highly evolved polar bear or a sponge over billions of years. You are a unique creation of God. He breathed into you the breath of life, and you were created in his image. In the image of God, he created you. Male and female, he created you. Then when he was done with all the creation... Verse 31, he looked at all that he had made, and what did he declare? It is very good. But he did create choice. That tree in the midst of the garden, the garden of good and e uh, the, guard, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. And he said, if you eat of that fruit, you will die. So why is this world so sinful? Because we were disobedient. Sin caused all the degradation. All the nastiness, all the ugliness, the death, the greed, the lust, the hate, the anger is all here because of sin. Not the way God created it. God created the world perfect. He put us as stewards of the creation. And this world is the way that it is because of sin. That's a biblical worldview. Now, as opposed to this is the worldview that you will meet at the Museum of Natural History. You'll meet it in many of our natural science textbooks. Some of the quote-unquote smartest scientists in the world and quote-unquote smartest secular philosophers in the world will espouse it. We spend millions of dollars of upkeep on the Museum of Natural History to teach it to our children. And it is this worldview. The diversity of life on earth is the outcome of evolution. An unsupervised, impersonal, unpredictable, and natural process of temporal descent with genetic modification that is affected by natural selection, chance, historical contingencies, and changing environments. That I took directly from the National Association of Biology Teachers. That the diversity of life on this earth is an outcome of Darwinian evolution. Unsupervised, meaning no one is directing it. Impersonal, no relationship. Unpredictable. All this order came from chaos. And we, you and me, human beings, are nothing except the last line, or the current last line, of an evolutionary process, and you and I are simply biological animals. That's the truth. That is all we are. 
According to this definition, all you and I are are biological animals. Just the highest functioning of those animals. Now, all of that, those are two worldviews. One, there is a God who created us. We are unique in his creation. He created us perfectly. The other, you are nothing more than a biological animal over billions of years of genetic modification has led to you. And that is all you are. Those are the two competing worldviews. And by the way, the secular society in which we live considers the left worldview, the biblical worldview, to be silliness and the right to be intelligent. Make no mistake. Now, all of this is a backdrop to a simple question. How do we know that which is right and moral, and how do we know that which is wrong and immoral? Don't answer the question. It's rhetorical. Every single human being makes choices every single day. Should I tell the truth or should I lie in this situation? How much alcohol should I drink? What time should I put my children to bed? What are my choices for... Did you hear my kid? Never! Uh, what choices? What choices should I make for entertainment? What should my sexual ethics be? You're making these moral choices constantly, consistently, every day, all the time. How do we know what is the right moral decisions and how do we know that which is wrong and immoral? How do we judge what is right and how do we judge what is wrong? You know, back in 2012, there was a very famous case in Virginia. The American Civil Liberties Union, uh, the ACLU, filed a lawsuit against a Virginia school who had a placard of the Ten Commandments on their school grounds. By the way, this, it's so Orwellian, isn't it? The American Civil Liberties Union is one of the most anti-religious, hateful groups about religion in the United States of America. But their title tells you, I mean, it's just Orwellian. Anyway, the ACLU files suit against the Virginia school because it has a placard of the Ten Commandments. The judge in the case, Michael Urbanski, offered a compromise with the school district to see if we could get these two opposing parties on the same team. And he said, how about we do this? How about you just eliminate all the commandments that have to do with God and just highlight the commandments that don't? Well, it is laughable. And just highlight the commandments that don't. So the way Lutherans number them, forget, forget, you shall have no other gods before me. Don't misuse God's name. And remember the Sabbath day. Forget those. Just eliminate them. And keep four through ten. Keep those. Because four through ten has to do with how we horizontally treat with one another, not vertically in our relationship with God. So basically what the judge said was, let's simply eliminate God from morality. That was the compromise. And that is what the secular world attempts to do. Let's have morality without God. So, leads to a question. How do I know if there is no God? So let's assume the Darwinian evolution uh, mindset. If there is no God, how do I know that which is right and wrong? So I understand that you're here on an evening of bad weather, and you're watching when you could watch anything else. So I'm going to assume that you all believe the biblical worldview. Suspend that for a moment and pretend that you are a Darwinian evolutionist, okay? And ask yourself the question, if I am simply the last line in a long line of genetic modifications over billions of years, if I am just a biological animal, how do I know? concretely what is right and wrong. As a Darwinian evolutionist, how do you know what is right and wrong? Is your dog moral? I think that's a very important question. Is your dog moral? Is your cat a moral creature? 
No, no, I think this is, they're not. And those are high animals, high functioning. But you wouldn't call them moral. So here's the question. If you're a Darwinian evolutionist that believes that you are nothing more than a highly evolved polar bear, let me ask you a question. How do you make choices about morality? Does the term morality even really have meaning? <clears throat> Simply put, if the Darwinian evolutionist is to be transparent, this is the decision they must come to. The individual or the society decides what is right and wrong. This can vary depending upon the individual or the society. What is that basic? I mean, that's really what they have to come to. What does that mean? I get to make it up. What? For myself. Now, I'm not trying to paint them this badly. They do this themselves. Honest Darwinian evolutionists say the same thing. Michael Roos uh, is a philosopher who works on philosophy and biology from an evolutionary perspective. Michael Roos is very popular. You'll find him on the Discovery Channel, the History Channel. You'll find him on CNN, MSNBC, and all the news stations when we talk about these kinds of things. E.O. Wilson is the foremost and preeminent mind on sociobiology. Basically, why animals, including humans in his mind, do what they do. This is what they said in tandem together. Morality, or more strictly, our belief in morality, is merely an adaptation put in place to further our reproductive ends. Let's just stop that sentence. Do you hear that? Morality is an evolutionary thing that it's fake. It's put into our minds just so that we can copulate and the species can continue. Because in an evolutionary mindset, what's your purpose? To reproduce. That's the purpose. What do sharks do? They eat and sleep and make little sharks. Well, all you are are biological animals. So this sense, this idea of right and wrong and morality is nothing more than something that keeps you guys going to copulate to continue the species. Hence, the basis of ethics, ethics is a fancy word for morality, does not lie in God's will or in the metaphorical roots of evolution, or any other part of framework of the universe. In an important sense, ethics as we understand it is an illusion, fobbed off on us by our genes to get us to cooperate. It is without external grounding. Ethics is produced by evolution, but it is not justified by it. Meaning, we've got ethics, but it's a sham. Because like Macbeth's dagger, it serves a powerful purpose without existing in substance. If you don't know what that reference is, the Shakespearean play Macbeth, Macbeth has an imaginary dagger hanging over his head. Uh, that is his conscience, um, making him feel guilty uh, as he makes a decision on whether or not to murder. All right, but the dagger is not what? It's not real. It doesn't exist. So at least they're What? honest. They're consistent. In an evolutionary mindset, there is no point to right and wrong. No point to morality. I have often, in pleasant conversations, I may come across more negatively right now than I do when I'm actually speaking to people in this way, but I'll ask people of this worldview, why shouldn't I murder you? I'll ask them, why, why, why shouldn't I murder you? And they would say, because it's wrong. And then I say, I think it's right. I think it's right to murder you. And they say, no, there's a law against that. So then I say, all right, so if the secular laws call it bad, then it's bad. And if the secular laws call it good, then it's good. And they said, yes. And I go, oh, so in 1860, it was totally fine to treat back black people like chattel, beat them, kill them, and trade them. It was perfectly legal. They said, no, slavery was wrong. How do you know? How do you know? It was legal. Perfectly legal. They say, well, it's wrong. How do you know? How do you know? I agree, but how do you know? Well, society gets to decide. I said, really? 
So if a whole society got together and decided that raping children was okay for that society, then what? Raping children will be okay. My point is, an evolutionist cannot answer the question, why are things right and why are things wrong? They can't do it because it demands God. But our society is living with something called moral relativism. Basically stated, moral relativism is the view that moral judgments are true or false only relative to some particular standpoint. For instance, that of a culture or a historical period and that no standpoint is uniquely privileged over all the others. Basically, no society gets to tell another society that what they're doing is immoral and what you're doing is moral. That's how we're living. Basically, don't tell anybody else what is what, right or wrong. That's the society in which we live. This helps us understand why the Hippocratic Oath was changed. Did you know that the Hippocratic Oath was changed? You should Google the original Hippocratic Oath. The Hippocratic Oath is the oath that doctors take, you know, the do no harm. Do you know in the original Hippocratic Oath, do you want to know what was included in that? Absolutely give no abortions. Do not help a woman get an abortion. Do not give them anything to kill their baby. That is in the original Hippocratic Oath. Well, our morals changed. So what they did was they simply conveniently took that out of the doctor's oath. That's moral relativism. In the same way, sexual ethics have completely changed in every possible way. What used to be understood that sex was between a man and a woman in marriage now went to two consenting adults. And now you don't even need to be an adult. California, you can be 14. Soon, the quote-unquote God of consent will go away as well. Because if morality is just what a society depend, decides it to be, then morality is constantly what? Changing. It's constantly changing. Now, societies are called to change their morals, by the way. But they're called to change their morals so that it meets God's standard. A perfect example of this, the Reverend Dr. Martin Luther King. He did not tell society to do something new. He told society to stand up and do something old. All men are created equal. He consistently said, let us live up to the true meaning of our creed. Do you see the difference? Encouraging people not to change the standard, but to live up to the standard that is concretely made. There is the difference. Which leads us to a biblical worldview. What is the Bible standard? The biblical standard is God is the standard of what is right and wrong. Morality is rooted in the perfectly good nature of the unchanging, all-powerful God of the Bible. God is light. In him there is no darkness at all. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. He has told you, O man, what is good, and what does the law require of you but to do justice, to love kindness, and to walk humbly with your God. All those words, justice, kindness, they make no sense without a standard of which to compare your behavior. Societies have changed. Societies have not always lived up to the moral judgments of God, but the moral judgments of God are unchangeable, immutable, and holy. God has never changed his mind. He has never changed his mind. If God changes his mind, then he is a God not to be trusted. Because he, if he has to change his mind, that means that what he was thinking before was what? Wrong. God has never changed his mind. If it was wrong at the time of Moses, it is wrong in 2021. It's really just that simple. Can you imagine a world, this is what the evolutionist has to believe. You know, in some countries, it is acceptable to 
rape boys. Little boys. Can you imagine living under a moral code where in the United States of America, that's evil, that's bad. But if you just hop on a plane and fly across the world and then do the same exact thing there, then it's altogether moral. Can you imagine that? That is the evolutionary mindset. You get to decide yourself. These are the dangers of Darwinian evolution. I'm going to put up two scriptures that only make sense with a concrete moral code given by God. Isaiah 5.20, Woe to those who call evil good and good evil who put darkness for light and light for darkness, who put bitter for sweet and sweet for bitter. That is us today. We call evil good and good evil. But how do I know? It's not because I think it's good or I think it's evil. This has nothing to do with Chris Agni's opinion. This has nothing to do with the way I feel. This has nothing to do with my passions or my wants. It has to do with an objective standard that walked down a mountain in the hands of Moses etched in stone by God himself. And even when Moses walked down the mountain, it wasn't something new. It was what they always knew to be right and wrong. He just put it in stone. So how do I know what is good and evil? Because God wrote it down for me. Because there is a God. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you know how stupid that sentence is in the worldview of Darwinian evolution? For all have sinned. What is sin? Doing something that's wrong. What is wrong? It's like Pilate, remember? When Jesus was before Pilate and Jesus said, whoever is of the truth believes in me. And what did Pilate say? What is truth? Our Darwinian evolutionist couldn't have said it better. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We know the standard and we failed it. And they are justified by his grace as a gift. Through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. Why is it so important to have a biblical worldview as it comes to morality? Because that only makes sense if you know the difference between right and wrong. And you know that you have sinned. God's greatest act of redemption only makes sense with a just, holy, moral code that you have broken and that I have broken. And we knew it and we decided to break it regardless. And out of his matchless love, he sent his son Jesus to die for you and me who broke the code broke the morality, we knowingly did it, and we lay our sin at the foot of the cross, and he forgives us. Christianity only makes sense if there is a moral code that we have failed and God loves us despite of ourselves. The simple fact of the matter is, you cannot consistently, we have a lot of felicitous inconsistencies in our brain, but You cannot be a Christian and a Darwinian evolutionist. They cannot coexist. They cannot coexist. There is a God who created everything. He created everything perfectly. We sinned against him. We knowingly sinned against him. We fell short of his glory. We deserved nothing but condemnation. And out of his matchless love, he sent his son, Jesus Christ, to live the life we could not live, to die the death we all deserved, and to rise again to give us new life. So that if we would admit our guilt and believe in Christ, he would wash us clean, he would forgive our sins, and we would have a right relationship with the Father. That is Christianity. And it cannot, it will not, coexist with the secular mindset. Guys, I hate to break it to you, but we are aliens and strangers in this world. And as this world consistently goes evil, instead of being angry about it, instead of cowering in fear, 
Instead of hating the world, we need to engage it with the truth. Because here's the thing. Do you want to know why the world hates biblical morality so much? Here's the secret. They know. Deep down, they know. When you're doing something evil, don't you know it? No matter how much you try and rationalize it, no matter how many excuses, no matter how many people you get around you to agree with you that what you're doing makes sense, you know. So do they. That's why they hate us. Because we, just the very presence of a Bible-believing Christian, just the very presence of a Bible-believing Christian is to them a hideous, disgusting thing. But we are called to love. We are called to engage. We are called to look at them as God looked at us when we were hideous creatures. And he saved us through his son. Do not be tempted to anger. Do not be tempted to hate. Be encouraged to love. To love as you have been loved. Amen? Amen. God is good. All the time. time. Father, we thank you. You are a good, a holy, an awesome, and a gracious God. Father, we thank you that you have shown us who you are. We thank you that you have created us. We thank you that you have redeemed us. We thank you, Lord Jesus Christ, for making us your own. Help us to live lives holy and well-pleasing to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Now, uh, under normal circumstances, of course, we continue with tithes and offerings, but these are not normal circumstances. Uh, Therefore, you can put your tithe in the uh, plates there in the back, or, of course, you can go online to uh, to lcoos.org, and you can give your offering online. Please rise for the prayers. Gracious Heavenly Father, We thank you that you created the diversity of this world. We thank you that everything is uniquely knit together by you. We thank you that you hold all things together by your loving hand. We thank you that you have knit us together in the wombs of our mothers. You've given us life, breath, movement, and being. And though we sinned, you still loved us. And you sent your son, Jesus Christ, to die for our sin, to rise again, to give us new life. We thank you for opening up our stone-cold hearts by the power of your Holy Spirit and breathing into us born-again life. I pray, Father, that we would never become arrogant because of your work in our life, but instead, may we be compelled by our salvation to live lives holy, well-pleasing to you. I pray that we speak to our neighbors, our friends, and our enemies about your matchless love and grace. I pray against Satan's work of arrogance or temptation to hate or temptation to run and to flee. Instead, Infect us with the spirit of Jesus Christ that was in the world, but not of the world. Help us, Father. Help us. We pray for the Circuit 8 outreach. We pray for our instrumentalist needs. We pray for Dennis Santigui and Isita. 
the special needs of Nikki and Arnie, Chris and Beth, VG and Maria, Gabrielle and Jalissa, Marcus and Deanna, Adrian, Olivia, Marta and Elsa, Heal, Cheryl, Kathy, Rick, Tom, Kim, Patricia, Crystal, Kara, Buffy, Carlos, Silberio, Marcella, Amparo, Carmen, Antonio, Clarine, Bruce, Dorothy, Lydia, Mary Jane, Carol, Dane, Johnny, and Errol, Eustace, and Kajatu. Heal them, Jesus. Turn to salvation, Rick, Shelley, Tom, Dave, and Eric, Joey and Bobby, Joe, Wilfredo, Rafael, Rodriguez, Cindy, Regina, the Pools, the Esserts, and Brooke. We pray for the Uloma family who lost a loved one. Comfort them in the midst of their sorrow and bereavement and turn them to the Christ who lives. We pray for President Biden. We pray for our Congress and judiciary. We pray for Governor Hogan. We pray for our local officials. We pray for our county commissioners. Imbue them with wisdom. Help them, Father, to make choices and decisions based upon your word and what is good for the nation. We pray concerning the scourge of this disease, COVID-19, and the ramifications in all of our lives. Father, we know that your hand is behind everything. So I am praying that this is a wake-up call to the world. to turn to you. And Father, I thank you. I thank you for protecting the Lutheran Church of our Savior, and I pray for that continued protection. For it is only you that saves. Jesus, you testified to the sinful world, and you make an amazing promise. You whisper to your bride, I am coming soon. We, your people, we look up toward heaven with a smile on our faces. We respond with a simple prayer. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. We look forward to the day when every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that you are Lord. We look forward to the day when the sky rolls back as a scroll and the moon of blood and the sun of darkness because on that day we rise from the dead and we live forever with you in everlasting blessedness and peace. We walk hand in hand with every believer risen from the dead and we all embrace the living Lord Jesus Christ. No more weeping, no more mourning, no more death, no more pain, no more COVID, no more sin. But if you tarry, I do pray that we live authentic lives of Christian love. That we love our enemies. Do good to those who hate us. Bless those who curse us. Pray for those who mistreat us. And in this way, show the true love of God to a hurting world. Hear us, Father, as we pray the prayer you taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face shine on you and be gracious to you. May the Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Amen. Say, say it again. Say it again. You're good. <laughs>
Well, please, please, please. please. I'm, I'm well, sir. I'm well. Now go in peace and serve the Lord.